Tres hombres a la mesa, or el almuerzo. It's a painting by Diego Velázquez in the Hermitage Museum of St. Petersburg, where three men are just about to enjoy a plate of mussels. Michelangelo Merigi painted Ragazzo Morso da un Ramarro. It's in the National Gallery in London, and it's hard to see, but I found this close-up where the lizard is biting the boy's finger. This painting by Edward Munch, self-portrait with the flu, shows him in a stage of really being very sick. His bed is not made, he's not groomed, and he is in quarantine because he got the flu in 1919. Michelangelo Merizzi also painted Canestra di Frutta. And why am I showing you all of these paintings? Because in all of these cases, we can have antibodies either to the lizard bite, the poison, or to the shellfish, or to the flu virus, or we can have in, in the fruit basket a lot of allergens. There could be ants in there, but we can have allergic reactions to either the food or the different vegetables. And we are going to cover today the antibody responses. B cell humoral response is characterized by the presence and production of antibodies. And we are going to cover the relationship between the T cells and the B cells for producing these antibodies. What you see here is an example of our tissue. It could be the lungs if we inhale the virus like the flu virus, or it could be the GI tract if we eat something like shellfish and we are allergic, or it can be the skin if we are bitten by a lizard, for instance. So whatever the danger signal is, we have cells that are sentinel cells. They are everywhere in the body. They're called dendritic cells, and they have the ability to identify these danger signals. They can be large microbes, they can be large venoms, but they can identify them in the whole. And because these dendritic cells can travel everywhere, they travel to the lymph nodes. The lymph, lymph nodes are secondary lymphoid organs where we have the T cells and the B cells residing. This dendritic cell comes in into the lymph node and it presents what I have depicted here as a red oval. So it's just a little piece of the whole danger signal. As you can see, there's some red spots in the whole danger signal, but the T cell cannot see the whole thing. T cells are a bit blind. They need to be shown just the important part that they can recognize. And that's what the dendritic cell does. They process the danger signal and they present this epitope to the T cell. They are antigen presenting cells and the way that they present it is through what we call the class two major histocompatibility complex, MHC. We're talking about B cell production, B cell stimulation and antibody production. So that's why I'm talking about class two CD4 T cell. This is the one that the dendritic cell will present the epitope to. Now, if they only present with a class two, this T cell will not react. They need what we call a co-stimulatory signal two. So there should be two signals, and I cover that in another video. This is like a handshake, like a special handshake, or you know, calling the T cell and saying this signal is for real. You do need to come and help us. And each handshake is different. You can see here I depicted like in a different color. Uh, I depicted a different antigen. And if you realize the handshake, I flipped it around. So it's a different handshake for different kinds of antigens that the dendritic cell is presenting. Now, in this example, this particular co-stimulatory signal will produce interleukin-4 that is going to drive the differentiation of the T cells into what we call Th2 phenotype. And these Th2 cells that now recognize through the MHC class two complex, the antigen are going to proliferate. The T cells are usually in the medulla, in the inner part of the lymph nodes, and in the periphery, we have the B cells. So once these Th2 cells have proliferated, they are active and they express in the surface CXCR5. This is a migration molecule that takes them closer to the B cell area 
from the T cell area. So the T cells normally are in the center, in the medulla, and the B cells are in the periphery. And when they encounter a B cell whose receptor also binds that particular danger signal, these B cells are also going to express the CX CCR7, which is a molecule that brings them closer to the T cell zone. So the T cell is getting closer to the B cell zone, and the B cell is getting closer to the T cell zone. This allows this interaction, and this is a very strong interaction that then tells the B cell that carries that particular receptor identifying the danger signal to proliferate. Now, this proliferation of the B cells and the T cells in the lymph nodes is one of the explanations for why we have lymphadenopathy, which could be painful and enlarged lymph nodes when we have an infection. Not only there's activated B cells that are uh, proliferating, but also they differentiate into plasma cells that are very specific now to produce antibodies against that danger signal. From the lymph node, they will travel back to the body, and when they travel, they bind or they find the place where the danger signal is located. So, you know, it can be in the serum, but it can also be on the skin or it can be on the lungs, wherever they are, because now they're traveling everywhere. But also those plasma cells that differentiated are going to travel too. And at the site of the danger, they are going to start secreting these antibodies that bind that particular danger signal. So that's how we can get the antibodies to the place where either the venom is or where the virus infection is happening. In another talk, I am going to explain what happens with activated B cells and plasma cells, which are memory cells, and where they go. But for this particular talk, this would be like a first step for the primary response. And this is what the formation of the first antibodies is going to look like. Let's begin reviewing the primary antibody response. So for now, let's forget the memory cells. When we have the challenge, which is the first time that a signal is perceived as a danger signal, the naive B cell will differentiate into the activated B cells. These activated B cells were driven by CD4 TH2 cells and signaling, they are specifically identifying the danger signal. They differentiate into plasma cells that are the ones responsible for the production of antibodies. And what we have first is the short-lived plasma cells. This process takes anywhere between 5 and 15 days, depends on the danger signal, and it also depends on the immunological status of the individual. How good is the immune response of the individual when they encounter this danger? I want to also mention that there's an exception to this timeline. The very fast response that occurs with allergic or anaphylactic reactions that can be within minutes, and it's characterized by IgE, is covered in a different um, tutorial in YouTube. Besides the anaphylactic responses, the other B cell response, as I mentioned, takes about uh, a week or so to have the titers detectable. In the y-axis is the amount of antibodies shown in this hypothetical graph, where the blue curve is how the antibodies start rising until they get to the peak. When they get to the peak in this primary response, it's basically IgM. These are the product of these short-lived plasma cells, and they all identify the danger signal. A few of them could be IgG, if you want to look at the isotype uh, switch video I have, I'm also adding a link to that video. What happens over time if the individual is not exposed to that same danger signal is that the titers of the antibodies now are going to go down. And it's basically because there are some long-lived plasma cells in the bone marrow. These were triggered by the same initial danger signal that in time, if there's no further exposure to the danger signal, they will eventually disappear and the titers will go back to zero. That is the primary antibody response. 
The secondary antibody response is characterized by having memory B cells. What this means is that the B cells have created memory against the original danger signal. So when we encounter the same danger signal or something similar, our B cells are very quickly able to differentiate into plasma cells and produce very high levels of antibodies to the danger signal. These are now IgGs because they have matured and they can effectively deal with the danger signal. Like if it is an infectious agent, they can do this. Now, the characteristic of this secondary response is not only that there's very high titers, but it responds very quickly to this re-challenge. So after the uh, B cell activation and differentiation, the short-lived plasma cells leaves the lymph node through the lymphatic systems. And in the subclavian vein, they drain into the blood system. They circulate and when they find the danger signal that they can identify, they produce the appropriate antibodies that will get uh, rid of that danger signal. In the process of differentiation of the B cell, the humoral response can also create long-lived plasma cells. These cells will actually reside in the bone marrow after traveling outside from the lymph node and going into circulation. And these long-lived plasma cells will be responsible for low-level antibody production. The idea is these circulate between the blood vessels and the bone marrow, and they are producing antibodies. So when we encounter the danger signal again, there's a level of antibody that can help. So in the process of activation and differentiation of these B cells, we also can produce what we call memory B cells. These memory B cells reside in the bone marrow, but they also circulate through the blood vessels, the whole body. And if they encounter the same danger signal again, they very quickly differentiate into plasma cells that will produce very high levels of antibodies that are specific for the danger signal. And they do this very quickly, much faster than during the primary response. This is what characterizes a secondary response. And the difference between the long-lived plasma cells and the memory B cell is that long-lived plasma cells will produce a rather lower level of constant antibody production for as long as they live, whereas the memory B cell does not produce antibodies, but they can quickly differentiate into plasma cells that will produce antibodies very quickly at high titers. What drives these two different responses and how long they last? It depends on many different factors, but we do know that for some antigens, we have memory for life, Whereas for others, we may actually require to reestablish a new uh, response frequently or every so often. So one example of a long lasting memory B cell is for instance, when we get vaccinated with childhood vaccines. Uh, the polio is one of the examples, of course, where we only need to be vaccinated once and we get this memory response for life. The vaccine against uh, the measles, mumps, and rubella virus is also a childhood vaccination that does not require to be given later on. We do create uh, defense for life. So these memory B cells are going to be long lasting and are going to protect us against these viral diseases. Self-portrait with the Spanish flu from 1919 is a painting by Edward Munch where you can see his bed is made, he's dressed up, he's ready to go out, but he can't. In Europe at the time, there was a strict regulation that everybody who had the flu had to stay in quarantine and isolation. He also painted self-portrait with the flu a year later. You can see now his bed is a mess, he's sitting down, he's not dressed up, and he's not groomed. So what is happening is it's the same flu. We know it's not. The flu lasts very short time. So when you have it, it goes away quickly. Many people died of the flu between 1918 and 1919, but people could get sick again the following year. 
We know that now that we have availability of vaccines that we need to get vaccinated every year because the memory B cells and the short-lived plasma cells do not last as long as they do for the childhood vaccinations. For instance, measles or rubella or the polio that once we get vaccinated, we are protected for life. In the case of this virus, the flu, and other viral diseases, uh, either because the virus mutates or because our immune system rapidly gets rid of those cells, we don't really know, but evidently we do not create long-lasting memory. Another thing that's important is that between 1918 and 1919, there were a lot of other artists that were suffering from the flu. Gustav Klimt died of the flu in 1918. After he suffered a stroke, he was hospitalized where he got the flu from all of the hospitalizations around him that had the flu, and he died of pneumonia. Egon Schiele died at his home three days after his pregnant wife died of the flu, both of them with the flu, and he was in his late 20s. Guillaume Apollinaire is another famous artist that died of the flu in 1918. So this was creating havoc because it was really hard to get protective antibodies timely to the virus. Many, many got ill, many died, and that was one reason why it was so important to get a vaccination and to understand how often we needed to get vaccinated. Déjeuner sur l'air, the painting by Monet, has all the characteristics of Monet of using that light through the leaves and all of the components. He's depicting a group of young people. Uh, many of them have been identified as his painter friends, and they are having a nice picnic on the grass. This has all the elements that can create antibodies. So this is where we do not want to have an antibody response when it's not truly a danger signal. What do I mean by that? Well, there's food allergies to peanuts or to the trees. There's also allergic rhinitis to pollens that could be going around, uh, reactions to bee stings or insect bites, and also to dog saliva or a dog dander, just in case you missed it, the dog is also there. So what happens is that sometimes when we are being protected by our immune system, we do want a long-standing memory, or at least understand how often we would need to get a vaccination. But there are circumstances where our immune system is hyper-reactive to something that is not really dangerous. And medicine nowadays can control both, provide us with vaccines so that we can react to the danger signals correctly, and also dampen immune responses when we are creating antibodies to things that we don't want to react to. I hope you found this particular video entertaining and uh, useful for understanding antibody responses. These are some of the references that I used. I highly recommend the Federation of Clinical Immunology Society's advanced course in basic and clinical immunology. I have taken this course regularly through the years, and this past one was March 7 to 9, 2022. As usual, this course was excellent, and I learned a lot of the different concepts about B cell maturation, differentiation, and antibody formation. Thank you very much, and please don't forget to check my other YouTube channel videos. Thank you.